are in week two of our series. Uh, and my name is Efren Pena. If you're visiting us for the first time or watching online, my name is Efren Pena. I'm the campus pastor here. And like I said, we are in week two of our series, Senseless, right? It's a, it's a series based on the understanding that God is wanting a relationship with us that's highly sensory. That's highly sensory, right? Not just something that's purely intellectual, but also one that can be experienced and observed. One that involves the uses of our senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. Now, last Sunday, we talked about sight, right? If you missed last Sunday, you can catch it on our podcast channel. Uh, You can catch it uh, on our YouTube video. Uh, But um, how many of you did your homework? I gave you homework. I know one person for sure. One person absolutely did his homework, right? And and, and I'm I'm not gonna mention his name. But he has something really bright on, and, and it's just so, I was, I was impressed. I was impressed because so many times as a pastor, you leave here, right? You always say, man, that's, I always get told, hey, that's a great message. Love the message. That's awesome. But more than that, more than that, that's really cool. That's like patting me on the back. That's really cool. But, that, but the, the, if you want to make my heart go boom, 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 is apply. Apply what you're being taught. And, and I was so excited to hear that someone did their homework, that someone went out and, and, and really awkwardly just stood there in front of someone that they see every day and just stared at them, trying to find something different that they've never seen before. It can get uncomfortable, really, it can, but it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding to see God's beauty and God's creation in a different light. And uh, if you haven't uh, seen that, uh, uh, if, you have, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go listen to it or watch it. Uh, it's great homework. We talked about sight. Today, we are, we're going to get to talk about hearing, right? Why what we listen to changes us and half of Jesus' catchphrases were about hearing, Right? Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever watched or experienced something with the sound off or maybe with some noise-canceling headphones on? It's a completely different experience, right? Like, like, you ever watch a horror film with the volume completely off? It's almost borderline laughable. It's comedy. Because what makes you scared is the dun-dun-dun-dun. Right? It's the sound effects. It's the music that sets you up. Right? And then you, you, you're, like, you're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Something happened. But if you take all of that out, there's just someone walking through the door. Someone going, boo. It's a whole different experience. Right? It's actually kind of funny. Think about how much hearing shapes our experiences of everyday life in subtle ways. Most of us wake up to a sound, right? And that sound has a lot to do with the mood we wake up in. Now, whether that sound is like the old school eh, 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 alarm or your mom and dad, get up. Or the new wave, the birds chirping. <laughs> anybody, anybody? <laughs> Anybody else wake up to birds chirping? It's like, it's new. It's supposed to give you a new fresh start. And I'm like, shut the bird off. Right? Other sounds help us fall asleep, whether it's a fan. Like, winter, that thing doesn't turn off. It's, it's on. It's always on, right? Or an app that replicates the ocean or, in my house again, the forest. Like, literally, a cricket. I'm walking around thinking, cricket's in my house. No, it's an app that someone chooses to listen to, right? Other sounds, uh, sorry, uh, ever heard of a, uh, ever heard a, a loud and sudden, like, sound, and it took you, like, an hour to get your heart rate back down? Like, something fell, something was loud, and it's like, oh, my God, it startled you, 
right? Maybe, maybe you know someone whose voice is so soothing that they make the bad news sound relaxing, like Art LeBeau. Anybody, any fans? All right, uh, Sunday night, that was incredible. Just turn it on, play the oldies. Some of you don't listen to radio, okay. Ever found yourself in a, uh, in a grocery store just singing the tunes that, that, that they're playing uh, over the speaker? Or if you work out, you probably have some tunes that gets your blood pumping and gets you hyped and motivated to work out. But here's the thing, sounds don't just influence our moods individually. They impact how connected we feel relationally. We bond over sounds we find comforting, music that we like and voices that we listen to. In fact, our brains are hardwired from birth, from birth to to, uh, hone in on human speech. We can recognize hundreds of voices, identify some after a single sentence, and read the mood of others based on one or two words. Having a collective listening experience bonds people together. Whether it's a concert, and we were at a concert on on Friday, and... um, Monica and I had no business being in there because we just too old for that kind of stuff. But the mood, when they say bounce, that floor was bouncing. And I'm like, oh, my God, we're going to die here. We're going to die. But it was so awesome to see collectively a group of young believers bouncing and jumping and, and, and just being moved. Whether it's a speech or an alarm or a joke, Right? We get to experience it together. But no sound is more scientifically proven to bond us more than laughter. Humans smile and laugh long before they can even speak. And research shows that those who laugh frequently are happier and healthier for it. There's something about laughing with other people that's so much better than laughing alone. And it reminded me of, like, you put me and my brother-in-law Jason together, and all we do is laugh. Laugh to the tears, like, literally, we're just crying. And everybody looks like we're just dumb. And nobody gets the joke but him and I. And we laugh and laugh and laugh. And then we stop. And then come back and pick it up again and laugh about it, Right? Ever watched a movie in a theater with a bunch of your friends and you laugh so hard that you thought you were about to go potty on yourself, right? You left feeling elated, enjoyed, right? Then you watch the same movie later on in your house by yourself and it didn't have the same impact, the same effect. I mean, it was funny, yeah, but it was a lot funnier with them by your side. And laughing, laughing felt good, but it felt even better with them. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 12, 15, to be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Now, I find it interesting that, that he doesn't say just to be sad with sad people and happy for happy people. He tells us to engage in the physical, audible act alongside of them that clearly demonstrates that we can empathize with what's going on with them. It's as if he knew that we don't just need people to tell us that they get us, but that we need to see and hear Proof that they get us. And we've always been this way, friends. All ancient human societies threaded music into so many facets of of life, to communal, uh, communal gatherings, to work, military exercises, and religious ceremonies. 
In fact, scripture contains so many descriptions and instructions related to hearing. In Psalms 119, 105, right? God's words light his path. Romans 10, 17, faith is the result of hearing. James 1, 19, we should all be quick to listen and slow to speak. John 10, 27, my followers know the sound of my voice. Matthew eleven fifteen. that anyone who hears, excuse me, that anyone with ears should listen and hear. Now friends, maybe you're, you're thinking the same, right? The original audience would have thought, doesn't everyone have ears? Isn't hearing what we do with them? Maybe this is more than a literal statement and you might be onto something because as we said last week, scripture is art and rarely ever means just one thing. It continues to grow, right? Jesus was a master at speaking on multiple levels at once. In fact, I think we can identify at least six different types of hearing presented throughout scripture. I'm gonna give you, uh, give you them right now. The first one is uh, operative, right? The physical capacity of hearing, right? So let's imagine that, like last week, that we're back at the restaurant and there's a game going on on the screen, right? You might say, can you please turn that up? I can't hear what they're saying, right? That's operative, All right? Passive. Right, the absorption of background information. Like, who's winning? Oh, I'm guessing whatever team that the table, this table over here keeps cheering for. That's the team that's winning. That's passive hearing. Then there's selective hearing that many of us have. <laughs> this is the act of aiming your capacity in a specific direction. For men, it's usually not at your wife. <laughs> If you lean into, if you lean this way, you can hear what the couple on the other table is arguing about. That's selective listening or hearing. Defensive, the process of, of considering an alternative explanation. Like, no, technically, that was the wrong call. Hear me out. Attentive. The attempt to uh, understand another's point of view. Like, no, seriously, why do you like a team that doesn't win that often? And then there's active listening. The action that demonstrates your understanding, right? Like, I'm just going over, right? I'm just going over there and I'm going to, I'm going I'm to I'm have a party. I'm going to cheer it up, Right? They can't hear, but I'm going to make sure that everybody hears. I'm going to cheer on my team, right? In other words, when Scripture mentions hearing, it could be talking about one or all of these things, and sometimes several things at the same exact time. And what we know for sure is this, that hearing in all of its forms is enormously, enormously important to God. So with that in mind, I want to I share a story. I want to look at a story in the Bible about words, about hearing, about focusing and reacting to what's flowing into our ears. There's a famous, a famous prophet in the Old Testament uh, by the name of Elijah, right? He did a lot. He did a lot of great things for God. He, he seemed invincible, and God did enormous, enormous, obvious miracles through Elisha. One would say that he heard the voice of God. But it was a different voice that almost destroyed his life. If you've read the story of Elijah, you know what I'm talking about. But if you did not, we're going to quickly go through this, and I encourage you to uh, read it up at your own time. We're going to start with 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 2 and 3. Uh, and it says, so Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. 
May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. So someone is threatening Elijah. He heard what other people were saying to and about him, and he got very scared and ran away. You've probably been there before, right? You were having a normal day, but then you heard something. The chatter started, and it just threw you into a tailspin. Maybe it was a rumor at work or a news story, a diagnosis, a tax bill, a threat, a phone call from your kid's school, or a canceled date. Friends, when we hear something that we do not like, most of us don't pray. We panic. We don't pray. We panic. But Elijah is way, way more spiritual than you and I. He's a prophet. He's a prophet. And so what does he do? He does the same thing, the exact thing that we would do. He runs. First Kings 19.4 says, Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down on the solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. So I read this and I begin to think about questions like, why, why are you going to take a hike into the wilderness? Why did he have to go somewhere else to pray? Why couldn't he just pray where he was? Right? Why couldn't he just talk and listen to God from wherever he already was? Isn't God everywhere? Right? And he is. But God can hear you from anywhere, but you cannot hear him from everywhere. I want you to think about that. Think about that statement, God can hear you from anywhere, but you cannot hear him from everywhere, right? He has the ability to cut through the noise of any environment, but you and I, we don't. We don't have that ability. Our ears absorb all of the sound that is around us, right? But our brains cannot process it all at once. They help us by only bringing certain things to the forefront, to our awareness. The catch here is that the noisier the environment is, the more exhausting it is for your brain to try to pinpoint and focus on one particular thing. And the more intently you're focusing on one thing, the more difficult it is for you to hear anything else. And so my kids like to do homework with music, their iPods in their ears. And I keep telling them, you can't do two. You cannot study and listen to whoever it is playing a beat in your head. And on top of that, you're singing the lyrics. So how can you read, sing the lyrics, and bop your head at the same time? Not only that, you probably can do it, but what are you really focusing on? Every parent should say, amen, pastor. Maybe it's just my kids. I don't know. This is why <laughs> I'm coming to your kitchen. This is why your husband has no memory of you asking him how <laughs> to go to the grocery store and pick up a few things while he is watching the playoff game. I know at the time he seems interested. I know at the time he's not in his head in agreement. Yes, babe, you hear that? But scientifically <laughs> speaking, he has no clue. He didn't really hear you. He did passively, but attentively, because his brain was busy processing the touchdown that his team just scored. Unfortunately, you, a 
are just static. Your voice is just static. Now, <laughs> most of you ladies have realized that a crowded, right, a crowded sports bar is not the best place to have deep relational conversations about how you wish you were heard more. It's just not the place. He's not going to hear you there. So you're going to have to go somewhere else with a whole lot of less noise. And that's getting harder and harder to do, church. We're constantly surrounded by an ocean of sound all vying for our attention. Virtually every moment is full of music and videos and cell phones and your coworker talking, right, on the phone and the sound of the AC and, and the TV and the break room and the phone buzzing and the calendar alert going off and the motorcycle rocketing past you and the kids fighting and the voice inside of your own uh, head that's telling you, you didn't. You didn't get enough done today. How could I? With everything that is just coming in all at the same time. With everything coming in, our brains have trouble sorting what to tell our brain to listen to. And friends, it is taking its toll on us. Being surrounded by noise makes us anxious. It spikes up our stress level. It causes inflammation. Hello? That's why I'm a little rounded this day. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a lie. Waka, waka. <laughs> right? Jay, just you and I. Just you and I, Jay. And it increases our risk of heart disease and stroke and hearing loss. And it makes it difficult for us to focus, to critically think or fall asleep. All of which is contributing to a culture of exhaustion, agitation, and depression. And that's where Elijah, that's where he ended up. He knew, man, if, if I'm going to hear God, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Because all he could hear were the complaints of those who didn't like him and the threats of those who wanted to destroy him. And we know this because when he does pray, he prays this in 1 Kings 4, uh, 19 verse 4. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. For I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. He's done. He's done. He's in a pretty dark place. And maybe you are today as well. Maybe you're done. Maybe you're done because all of this world is talking. All of this world is, is, is coming at you, right? And I want to tell you why. It's because our feelings aren't determined by the facts. They're defined by our focus. Our feelings aren't determined by the facts. They're defined by our focus, right? First, uh, uh, in verses five and six, it says, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Now, why didn't God just respond to his prayer? Why didn't God just respond to his prayer and answer his question and give him perspective right then and there? I'll tell you why. Because I don't think he would have been able to hear it. I don't think he would have been able to hear what God wanted to speak to him at that moment. Ever try to, to have a really important conversation with your, <laughs> with your wife late at night? <laughs> I do. And you say, I feel like you're not listening to me. I don't feel like you're hearing me out. And she says, I'm not. 
You're absolutely right. I'm tired. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. Talk to me when I'm awake. I'm like, you are. You're responding to me. It's difficult. Or maybe, we'll flip the table here, maybe you tried to get your husband to listen to you. But no matter what you said, he was angry. He was angry and he was bothered. And you were like, I feel like, like, like maybe you're not listening to me. And he was like, yeah, I'm not listening to you. I'm so hungry right now, I can't pay attention to anyone. Right? I'm hangry. Amen. And then you got him some, some food and like everything was okay again. Right? Friends, research shows that when one of our senses is in overdrive, the others pull back to help us get our most urgent needs met at the time. So if his senses are blaring that I am hungry, he's, his hearing, he, you might as well, he, he's impaired. Because he can't hear what you're saying because his senses, everything is focused on, I want to eat. Does that make sense? So if you're starving, truth of the matter is you cannot think. Been there before? Yes. And that makes absolute sense, right? But this is true in even weirder ways. Check this out. The louder a restaurant, this is, this is, I, I didn't make this up, I, I researched this. The louder a restaurant is, the more difficult it is for you to taste the food. Everybody's going to go to lunchtime and you're going to go out and you're going to try this experiment, right? It's crazy. The louder the restaurant is, the harder it is to taste your food. Why? Because your ears are just absorbing They're hyper, they're just taking everything in and you cannot focus on what that juicy peppercorn garlic steak. I'm hungry, sorry. (laughs) It's tasting like. Listen, church, God knows Elijah won't be able to hear him, won't be able to focus on, to contemplate and even internalize what he's going to speak to his heart right, what he wanted to tell him until he has, ex, uh, he has exited the noisy environment, right, that he has walked off his angst, that he has slept, and that he has eaten. The next morning, the mind and body had reset for Elisha. He had gotten rest. He had gotten away from the noise. He had gotten food into his belly, right, And so now he continues on his journey and comes to a cave. And in verse 9, right, he sleeps in a cave and God questions him, right? This is the first time that he hears from God. That's, I find that really, really interesting, right? It's also interesting that the first thing that God gives him isn't an answer, but a question. He gives him a question. And all through scripture, this tends to be where God aims a lot of his conversations with people, getting them to question their own motives, getting them to question and acknowledge, right, that they've been listening. All along, they've been listening to the wrong voices. How many of us have been there before? We've been, we've been caught up and we've been listening to the wrong voices because we have not focused on listening to God's voice. And in verse 11, right, it tells us that the Lord passed by. The Lord passed by, right? God still doesn't answer his question. You're going to have to read this on your own. It's a really incredible story. But God still doesn't answer his question. Instead, he gives him some instructions and Elijah attentively listens and acts upon them. Friends, the best way to demonstrate that you're really listening to someone is to change your behavior based on what they just said. See, this is where you tap in to give me and to tell me that I am listening, Pastor. Yes, amen, right? Because now that tells me that you're paying attention. You see how that works? You see why it's important to make eye contact with people and nod your head? 
Because it tells the person that you're in a conversation, that you are listening, that you are attentive listening, you're engaged, and you're moving as they are moving. Verse 11 through 13, now God tells Elijah to go out and stand there before him. The, here's the thing. The Bible tells us that the windstorm came. Then the earth shook, and then there was also a fire, but God was not found in any of them. But then the Lord whispers to him, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And I think that God is trying to tell him, uh, what God, I think what God is trying to tell him here is, if you're only listening to what's the loudest, you're not likely to hear me. If you're only listening to what's the loudest, then you're going to miss what I have to say. I think God is still saying this to us today, church. Elijah wouldn't have heard it without putting the work to eliminate three levels of noise in his life. The first one is ever, ever, uh, environmental noise, the chaos and concerns of culture and the breakneck, at the breakneck speed that it's coming in our everyday life. The second noise is the social noise, the voices and relationships that you listen to and allow to influence you. And the third is the internal noise, the unchecked biases and negative self-talk skewing everything that you experience. Those three noise, noises need to be shut off in order for you to really listen to what God is trying to speak into your life. And so I wonder what noise you might need to eliminate or escape to actually hear what God is wanting to tell you. Maybe it's a place or a group you need to stop spending so much time around. Maybe it's, it's a friend or a podcaster or an influencer you need to spend less time with. Maybe it's a belief of fear about yourself or the world itself that you need to let go of. Friends, once Elijah clears out the noise and turns his attention to God, he begins to hear from him. And he knew it was God because what he said was something that Elijah didn't want to hear. He knew it was from God because it was something that Elisha did not want to hear. If God only seems to affirm, it's going to rock your world this morning. If God only seems to affirm what you already think, I'm not so sure you're always hearing from God. Because God is interested in helping us grow, church, right? And to grow, we have to learn. And learning requires us to discover where we are wrong and what we need to do to make it right. In other words, if you're wanting to hear God, listen to what you can learn, not just what is loud. You see, because it is when we listen is when we grow. Friends, God will challenge, will confront, and he will absolutely correct you. All by helping you hear something new. What God tells Elijah is to go back into the situation that he had run away from. Because although the situation was not good for him, right, he wasn't doomed. It wasn't the end for him. His fear of the future had a lot more to do with his focus than it did 
with the facts. And so he does, does what God says, not because he feels differently about the situation, but because his faith in God. His faith is in God, not his fear of the situation. You see, both both existed in his heart. Both existed in his mind at the same time. Before and after he hears God. But what changes is how much priority and attention he gave each one. Friends, God... God doesn't want you to ignore the issues that you're facing. But he does want you to act on what he is saying. He wants you to allow his words to light your path, to let what he says guide you through what you cannot see clearly. Because he knows. He knows. And if you do, your feelings and your perceptions will catch up with your actions. Meaning they're ultimately aligned with God. And as the saying goes, it's easier. I want you to hear this out. It's easier. I didn't put it on the screen and I regret it because I think this is incredible. It's easier to act your way into feeling better than to fuel your way into acting better. I'll say that again. It's easier to act your way into feeling better than to feel your way into acting better. Hebrews 2.1 says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. Listen very carefully, meaning focus in on, give your attention to, to what? To the truth, to the truth, right? Not to what is entertaining, not to what is most exciting, not to what is the loudest, not to what is the the most nerve wracking, but to the truth. And the listening he's talking about is active listening, acting in a way that demonstrates that you understand what you're listening to. And he says, or we may drift away. Why? Because there's so much noise around us. There's so much noise around us. In many ways, the author is just echoing Jesus. He's saying, you have ears Use them to hear. So I'm going to wrap this up. When I was a kid, they they made fun of my ears because they were so big. And um, and they just like kind of stand out. Like my my kids laugh at me because be like, Dad, your ears can hold up your hat, your pencil, your headphones, like all of it. It's incredible. I was like, don't hate the player, right? I do that for my kids, really, because I know they're just squirming in their seats. But as a kid, I was made for these ears, and and and, and now it was just I didn't understand. But my mom was a single parent. I shared that before, and it wasn't until I actually started to pay attention to what my dad looked like. And so my dad had big ears as well. I didn't realize that until later. But his looked even much bigger because he was only this big. So he was literally like baby Dumbo. It was just like, or baby New Year, right? Just big years. And the more I think about it today, reflective to the message, like, man, God has given me ears to not just hear the sounds around, but to hear him, to hear his voice.
I've been married. I'm going on almost 30 years being married soon. And I can I can tell you my wife's voice. I don't even need to look. I don't even, I can hear it. And I know that's my wife speaking. I've just spent a lot of time around her. She speaks, I listen. Sometimes this game's not on. I ain't dumb. But I know her voice because I've spent a lot of time with her. And I got to me thinking is how many of us struggle to know God's voice or hear his voice? And I wonder if we struggle to hear his voice because we don't know what his voice sounds like because we have not spent enough time in his presence. Friends, the reality is, is God speaks to us through a lot of different things. Something smart for you to do might be taking inventory of everything you're listening to and what's it doing to you. Whose voice has the most influence in your life? Who are you most focused on? And what are they saying? And to be honest, you might not quite, you, you, you might not quite be able to, to see what everything you listen to is doing to you. But I'm pretty sure the people around you can the people around you can so your homework is Paul in the room I'll make sure he gets the homework your homework is to ask one or three people who know you well which voices or noises set you off and which put you on the right track listen to them Listen to them, and for your own sake, demonstrate that you have heard and understood by acting on what they have to say. Because I believe with all my heart that if we begin to to put this into play, we're going to live a different life. We're going to see things, hear things at a whole different level. And not only will your relationship with those around you be better, but I'm almost going to guarantee, in fact, I'm going to guarantee that your relationship with God will be different and will be better. Sometimes it's just turning off the noise on the outside so that you can hear God's voice on the inside. Amen? Let's pray. Fabulous Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text 
text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.